Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Here's what we have in the bulletin. Opposition blasts government for tabling wrong regulations for St. Catherine's state of emergency. Bridging the digital divide, the latest coming out of the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Rwanda. And later in sports, the highly anticipated four-day National Senior and Junior Athletics Championships begins today at the National Stadium. I'm Kalisha Williams and here are the details. The government is under fire this afternoon for the tabling of the wrong regulations for the state of emergency in St. Catherine in Parliament on Tuesday. According to President of the People's National Party, Mark Golding, the incident is a messy, negligent and embarrassing episode. A PNP Divisional Conference in the Mount Industry Division of St. Catherine on Wednesday evening. In his address to the people, Party President Mark Golding had a new topic to blast the government about. The regulations for the state of emergency, which he brought us to Parliament yesterday, so they could be tabled. Having earlier in the morning yesterday had Parliament issue a notice saying there'd be no parliament this week. A couple hours later, we get a totally different notice saying we must come because they need to table the regulations for the state of emergency. So we say, all right. On Tuesday, those regulations were passed. But on Wednesday, Mr. Golding said he received a call from National Security Minister Dr. Horace Chang. He said, Sometimes it's kind of hard to hear when he talks, but I was listening intently. And he said to me, the regulations that were at the table yesterday were the wrong regulations. They didn't have any of the things that we intended to put in it. It was a, it was a mistake. So I'm going to have to ask you to come back to Parliament tomorrow so we can table the right regulations. I said, what can I government this? Mr. Golding said he found the error even more embarrassing because the government has an entire ministry dedicated to addressing legal and constitutional affairs. It's a messy, negligent and embarrassing episode. <laughs> and they better make sure that those regulations at the table tomorrow confirm to what the court has said about the constitution because we will only support measures that are lawful and constitutional. We are not going to be part of any system to take away the rights of the Jamaican people. Meanwhile, in a statement Thursday morning, National Security Minister Dr. Horace Chang said he has ordered a probe into how the wrong regulations were passed. Dr. Chang said the error is regretted and the current regulations in keeping with the recent court ruling will be tabled in the House today and the Senate tomorrow. We go now to Rwanda, where the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting is currently underway. Janela Precious joins us with the very latest. Janela? Thank you so much, Kalisha. Well, I'm actually coming to you live from the Media Hub at the Kigali Convention Center. There's lots happening around me, as you would appreciate. I'm also trying to monitor various events. The UK Prime Minister, for example, Boris Johnson, uh, not too long ago spoke at the close of a business event. The Prince of Wales, Prince Charles, is also speaking at a summit on malaria and neglected tropical diseases. But I want to focus on the presentation by Prime Minister Andrew Holness. He was the main speaker at a business forum on bridging the digital divide. Now, as you are well aware, the COVID-19 pandemic amplified several issues in the digital space. Mr. Holness pointed out that developing nations have some way to go in the areas of access as well as education in ICT. It is evident that the way forward for middle-income Commonwealth states will require even greater investment in research and innovation to build digital capacity and to ensure that we are empowered, enabled, and indeed repositioned to manage shocks and take advantage of opportunities.
We caught up with the Prime Minister after his presentation where we engaged him about the heated race for the Commonwealth Secretary General. He explained the importance of a Jamaican being at the helm of the Secretariat. It is an opportunity, I believe, for Jamaica to offer to the Commonwealth um, uh, leadership, management, governance, uh, and to bring a perspective to the issues that would not just be beneficial for small island developing states, but beneficial for the family of the Commonwealth on issues such as climate change, uh, issues to deal with trade and investment, which I think much more can be made of the Commonwealth platform. And as the world order is evolving um, and globalization is changing in nature, groupings like the Commonwealth offer uh, an opportunity. And I think uh, more countries are seeing the Commonwealth, the countries within the Commonwealth, as uh, a possible economic grouping. Mm -hmm. So all of the side events and meetings are coming to an end tomorrow. Uh, it's tomorrow is the official opening ceremony of the Heads of Government meeting. And of course, we'll have more on this story in primetime news this evening at 7. The island's egg sector is now facing a myriad of challenges, which according to Egg Farmers Association can be detrimental to the sustainability of the industry. But as we hear in this report from Cody and Barrett, the association president is again calling for governmental in intervention. The Jamaica Egg Farmers Association is calling for more to be done to protect the local egg sector. President of the association, Mark Campbell, says the sector has struggled through 11 increases in production costs over two years. While the price of eggs remain the same, he now wants something to be done. We are at a major crossroads in the existence of the egg industry in Jamaica as we know it. The challenges currently facing the egg industry, they are of an existential nature. Those challenges, he notes, are threatening the very existence of the local egg industry. Another issue he raised is the low price farmers are paid for their product by major supermarkets and wholesalers. He believes a centralized marketing system must be set up to combat that. That if Jamaica does not move to market eggs through a central market, we are going to be dead. I know what we want. I know what, how we love to drive out of our communities with our little vans and boast when we go in the bars in the night how we, uh, I, you know, I supply such and such a place and I supply such and such a place and uh, my business. But in reality, we are fooling ourselves. He noted that with the current system, too many farmers are being cheated out of their money by unfair competition. When 20 of us are going to the same supermarket man to sell him eggs, who do you think is going to win that negotiation? It's a supermarket man. Because he's going to push one against the other and the other against one until he gets a price that he is comfortable with. And because it is a perishable item, and we're afraid to carry it back to a farm, or we're afraid to bluff him as he is bluffing. Okay. But we just believe that we must be in this constant fight with one another. It does not have to be a fight. It can be a situation where we are all winners. In the meantime, another call for the government to roll back the general consumption tax, GCT, on table eggs. Every single minister who has sat in the chair up at Hope has promised to deal with this matter, and we still wait. Mr. Campbell was speaking at the Egg Farmers Association's annual general meeting in Otorias recently. Cody Ann Barrett, TVJ News. 
Two men are dead after gunmen carried out a brazen attack in Falmouth this morning. The men have been identified as Fabian and Siobhan Williams of a Mason District Brownstown address. Both men are cousins. Milton Winston is the acting superintendent in charge of the Trelawney Police Division. About 2.30 a.m., uh, the police responded to reports of gunfire in the Peel Street area of Falmouth. On their arrival, they saw two men suffering from gunshot wounds. They were both rushed to the Falmouth General Hospital, where one was pronounced dead on arrival and the other was treated. That person has since succumbed to his injury. We are now conducting intense investigation in a double murder. However, we are yet to establish a motive for this murder. We are appealing to citizens who may have information that can assist us in our investigation to get in touch with us at 954-3222 or 119 or Prime Stop at 311. And it's now time for a break, but stay with us. More stories when we return. Welcome back to the Midday News and thanks for staying with us. Services at Transport Authority offices island-wide were disrupted for a third day as employees staged a protest against the departure of Acting Managing Director Willard Hilton. Employees from the various regional offices and representatives of taxi associations gathered outside the Transport Authority's head office this morning demanding the reinstatement of Mr. Hilton. Now our reporter Sandy Williams, who was on location, now reports. For a second day, some taxi operators and workers are again protesting at the Transport Authority located at 107 Maxfield Avenue. They are protesting against the resignation of Managing Director Willard Hilton. Now they believe he was forced to tender his resignation. I'm standing here with the rest of presidents and leaders of organizations. We have asked our members stay aside, continue working. We are going up front for you today. We want to show the government, to show the minister and show the nation that we are not demonstrating, we are not unruly. But for all these staff standing out here, when they normally stand and stand because they want goodness and they ask you to leave, they are standing now because they see something in the in their presence that work for them. General manager of operations at the agency, Ronald Anderson, said Mr. Hilton resigned on his own free will. When contacted, Mr. Hilton told me that he willingly tendered his resignation, but the workers are not having it. The fact is that it is for a long time that a managing director come here and attend to the morals of the staff. The aesthetic of the staff, right? Long term. And ensure that he's now going to look after the operators that this has to happen. In a release this morning, opposition spokesman on transport and mining, Mikhail Phillips, called for the immediate intervention of the Minister of Transport and Mining, Audley Shaw. Mr. Phillips said it was inexplicable that the minister has allowed the dispute to continue for two days and has remained silent and inactive. He is also calling on the minister to clarify the reason for the resignation of Mr. Hilton. The taxi operators and the workers are also appealing to the minister to intervene. Reporting from the Transport Authority on 107 Maxfield Avenue, I'm Sandy Williams for TVJ News. Time now for the Business Minute with Cody and Barry. In the world of business, the House of Representatives on Tuesday approved the General Consumption Tax Order 2022 resolution providing for the exemption of General Consumption Tax GCT on lithium batteries. Minister of Finance Dr. Nigel Clark informed that its popularity has been growing as an energy storage technology. Photovoltaic batteries for use in solar uh, were, had long been excused from GCT. But today, and there is some, a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of back and forth on this, but today, the category is not just photovoltaic that's used for renewable, but lithium-ion. 
And in the global economy, Sri Lanka's Prime Minister Ranhil Rikemi Singhe has announced that the country's economy has completely collapsed, leaving it unable to pay for essentials such as oil imports. It follows months of shortages of food, fuel and electricity and the realization that even the credit lines from neighboring India that have sustained the country so far will not be enough. And that's it for the Business Minute. I'm Cody Ann and it's time now for the top regional and international stories with Oshin Masters. In the region, Grenadians started casting their ballots this morning to elect a new government in a general election that Prime Minister Dr. Keith Mitchell called ahead of the constitutional March 2023 due date. Mitchell's new national party is among five political parties and one independent candidate facing the 87,506 voters and seeking a historic third consecutive term in office, having won the last two general elections by sweeping all the 15 seats in the parliament of a tri-island state. Its main challenger will be the National Democratic Congress that is being led for the first time by 44-year-old attorney Dickon Mitchell, who has vowed to win back the government the party lost in 2013. On the international scene, at least five people, including three children, died in an apartment far in Buenos Aires, Argentina, Thursday morning. A spokesperson for the city's emergency medical care system said two of the children were just three years old, while the other was eight. The other victims were two women aged 19 and 49. A total of 35 people were transferred to Buenos Aires hospitals, some with serious injuries. Firefighters stormed the building and managed to rescue several residents, including an elderly woman and children. It's not clear how the fire started, but one resident told local media she heard an explosion just before dawn. And those were the top regional and international stories. And we now head to a quick break. When we come back, we'll have your midday sports report. Bernardo Brown is standing by. Welcome back. It's now time for your midday sports. Now, at least two national records could be challenged on the opening day of the National Senior and the Junior Athletics Championships, which gets underway this afternoon at 4.30. NCAA Division I outdoor runner-up Navaski Anderson could look to lower the national 800-meter record as he is set to contest the semifinals of the event this at 6.15. Anderson erased the 45-year-old mark of 1 minute 45.30 seconds held by Seymour Newman when he posted 1 minute 45.02 to finish the second at the NCAA Championships. Anderson have 19-year-old Jamaica College athlete Javon Blake for company as he gets he goes in heat one. The other record that could be challenged is the mark of 1.97 meters in the women's high jump as current record holder Lamar Distin will contest the event. Distin, who is the NCAA Division I indoor and outdoor champion, already has six jumps of 1.93 meters or higher outdoor this season. And since setting the record of 1.97 meters in April, she has cleared 1.95 meters twice. She has a third best jump this year and could be pushed by 2019 Pan Am bronze medalist Kimberly Williamson, who has cleared a personal best 1.93 meters this year. A total of six finals are scheduled to be contested today, with three each among the seniors and juniors. Live and exclusive coverage of the championships will be on TVJ, TVJ Sports Network, and One Spot Media with radio coverage on Hits 92 FM. And the remaining semifinalists in the Jamaica Premier League will be decided later today when the second leg of the quarterfinal playoffs are contested at Sabina Park. Defending champions Cavalier and Mount Pleasant FC will battle at 5 p.m. with the game locked at nil all following Monday's clash. The winner of the match will oppose Dumbo Holden FC, who finished second in the league phase. Coach of Cavalier David Layla says they will approach today's game different. Well, it's a final, you know, and so whatever final, you know, it will be a little different and a bit tougher. So we just have to fix up some, come st some stuff and come third there. Just hope for the best, because it's, it's a tough Mount Pleasant team. Now you're good at the last game, but at the end of the day, we'll see what will happen come third there. 
At 7.30, former champions Arnett Garns and Harperview will look to break their deadlock after the first leg ended 1-1. Goals from Trayvon Reed and a late equaliser from Marlon Allen gave both teams a 1-1 draw. Now, today's game... They go into today's game on level footing. Arnett Gardens coach Paul Tika Davis says the second half on Mondays on Monday shows that uh, his team can get the better of Harper View. No, we have to, no, we made a lot of errors. You know, giving away the ball too much to this Harper View team, so they put the pressure on us. And in the second half, now you see we, we put the pressure on them. They start giving us the football, so we have to uh, minimize the, 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 the mistakes. I mean, or the errors, so to speak, you know. Now, league toppers Waterhouse will face the winner of that clash. And uh, that's it for your midday sports report. Kalisha, it's back to you. Thanks, Renardo. And that's the midday news. I'm Kalisha Williams. Join us at 7 for primetime news. On behalf of the news, sports, and production teams, good afternoon. <laughs>